So, the introduction um, to Ireland and Biafra Conference. Um, Fifty years ago tomorrow, October the 1st, 1960, Nigeria was granted full independence from Great Britain and joined the Commonwealth. Although the country had all the trappings of a democratic state and independence was see seen as the ideal outcome of the decolonization process, the early years of Nigerian independence were marred by unrest, coups and violence. At the end of May 1967, the eastern region of Nigeria declared itself as an independent state called the Republic of Biafra, led by the military governor, Lieutenant Colonel Emika Ojukwu. Initially dismissed by General Ikuba Gaon and the federal Nigerian government as a minor revolt requiring merely a police action for its resolution, the Biafran secession and the federal Nigerian response resulted in a war which lasted until January 1970 when Biafra surrendered. Despite the federal Nigerian insistence throughout that this was an internal affair, the British and the Russians supplied weapons, arms and ammunition to the federal Nigerian government. The Biafran state had some support, mainly from the French, but was far less well resourced, though many would argue extremely resourceful in their warfare. Due to the capabilities of modern communications and the skillful, skillful manipulation of global media by the Biafran government, far from remaining an internal affair as the federal Nigerian government had hoped, the war became an international matter with concern for the welfare of the Biafran people, resulting in widespread interest in their cause. In Ireland, the events provoked a public response, both emotional and financial, in support of the Biafrans on a scale which had never been experienced before. So might the Irish reaction be attributed to globalisation, a growing sense that the world was a smaller place and that a shared humanity was more important than national differences? Given the improvements in modern communications, maybe it was the power of the media and the immediacy with which stories of human interest could be relayed to distant audiences, making distance less of an issue. In 1955, Ireland had become a member of the United Nations, and in the late 1960s, membership of the EEC was on the cards. There was, as Dermot Ferreter describes it, a revitalisation of Irish foreign policy. Possibly it was this growing awareness of outside developments which energised the Irish in support of the Biafran cause. In addition, the Irish army had recently participated in its first major overseas mission since the foundation of the state, providing an armed peacekeeping force in the newly independent Congo from 1960 to 1964. Reminiscing about the experience, individuals recall their naive excitement about the big adventure for which they had volunteered, many of them having no idea where the Congo was. Subsequent analysis reveals that the young soldiers were poorly prepared and inappropriately equipped for the challenge they would face. By the end of the mission four years later, 26 men had died. But in spite of the deaths, lessons had been learned and there was a sense of national pride in the role the army had played and a sense of achievement. The Irish state had participated in an international peacekeeping role. These were undoubtedly elements in the fact of Irish awareness of this other African war, but there were other more specific reasons why the Irish took such an interest in the Nigeria-Biafra War, reasons which were related to modernity and co contemporaneous movements and ideas, but rooted deep in tradition, relig religious practice and historical memory. And so, while Irish engagement with the Nigeria-Biafra War was a phenomenon enabled by modernity and based in the context of the 1960s ethos of global responsibility, it also had a basis in more traditional aspects of Irish society and more local concerns, specifically those relating to the missionary project. I suggest that the complex relationship between Ireland and Biafra, which can be charted in newspapers, memoirs and archival material, provides insight regarding the persistence and the instrumentality of the past in Ireland's engagement with modernity. In order to contextualise the events and remind ourselves of the Ireland of the time, it might be helpful to consider the international milieu and the other stories which were in the news in the late 1960s. The Second Vatican Council had ended in 1965. Irish Catholics were increasingly conscious of the need for change in the church to keep pace with the rapid changes occurring in other aspects of their environment. The Vietnam War was grinding on, a war in which the Irish might be expected to have some investment due to the large numbers of Irish Americans and the traditionally strong relationship between Ireland and the USA. However, Vietnam doesn't seem to have achieved anything like the same level of coverage or interest in Ireland as Biafra did 
Closer to home in Northern Ireland, the first Civil Rights Association march was held in 1968. As institutional discrimination against Catholics was exposed and challenged, unrest grew and the troubles escalated. In 1969, the British deployed troops in Northern Ireland, and by 1970, there were refugee camps in the South for Northern Catholics fleeing the violence. I want to remind you of these events to demonstrate that the world was a troubled place in the late 1960s. Causes were being fought, and unrest and wars and human suffering were evident in many locations at the time. In Ireland, the Nigeria Biafra War was one event amongst many news stories. And the fact that the Irish took on the Biafran cause was not a case of there being a scarcity of news stories or an absence of causes to support. Paradoxically, at a time when Ireland was looking to Europe for an identity and international relationships, with membership of the EEC a topic for discussion, most Irish people were far more concerned with the war in West Africa than they were with events in Europe. Old relationships with the African continent, links that might even be described as imperial in nature, if not formally so, seemed to take precedence over the newly developing European identity which was being fostered. In the Dáil, Anthony Esmond protested to the government that, while the government was quick to make official protest re Czechoslovakia, it was silent on Biafra, which, as he said, concerned us more deeply. So why would it be felt that events in Africa would concern the Irish more deeply than events in Europe would? In 1967, Nigeria was the only African country in which Ireland had an embassy. This reflected the number of Irish people living in Nigeria, the majority being missionary priests and nuns. Since 1902, when Joseph Shanahan first began to work with the Igbo people, there had been strong Irish links with Nigeria, and more particularly with the Igbo population. The earliest reports of the war in Irish newspapers concerned the welfare of the Irish missionaries and the fact that most had refused to leave and insisted on staying with their people. There were also concerns raised about the viability of the missionary project itself and the infrastructure of schools and hospitals associated with the missions. In contrast with the British media, which, reflecting British investment in industry and oil, reported almost exclusively about the threat to oil supplies, a story in the Irish Independent in 19, June 1967 described how reports from Nigeria said that there appeared to be some danger of a shortage of altar breads in the East if the blockade was prolonged and some mission areas were already down to a month's supply. So as you can see, they had their priorities right. In the first half of the 20th century, missionary discourse portrayed Ireland as a sort of mother country to Nigeria, a role which entails responsibility for welfare. Up to this, spiritual welfare had been the focus of the relationship, but with the outbreak of war, physical safety and well-being quickly became an issue. I'll just... Uh, should have probably stuck this up a little earlier. This is um, the, the two leaders with, who, with whose faces I'm sure you're quite familiar. And um, this is a map showing how Biafra sh sort of shrunk, shrank over the co course of the war, which I can come back to if it's um, necessary. And I'll just this is the one I want to show you right now. Um, this is an image from an, an Irish missionary magazine um, from 1927. And it's one of my favourite images. I always use it in PowerPoint presentations because it represents Ireland as this kind of humongous country and Africa as this quite small um, <laughs> continent in relation. And as you can see, um, the Irish children are all at post boxes, posting letters and so on to Africa. And as you can see, specifically to Nigeria. And... Um, this sense of Ireland being a much larger and more sort of affluent society, and you know, the, the, the scaling of it is quite ludicrous, but um, this is, in a sense, the way Ireland was portrayed towards Africa. It was this sort of mother country that would send aid and send help and spiritual assistance to Africa. So, as I say, I, I like this picture. I think it's, it sort of demonstrates a, a, a mental kind of image that people had about Africa. Um, Mary Holland, an Irish journalist, wrote a piece on The Observer immediately after the war in reference to the Irish reaction to the images which had emerged from the war um, and recalled the fundraising campaigns for the black babies which were widespread in Irish schools from about 1920 onwards. And I'll just quote a little piece from her article. Um, you chose a name for your black baby and for a penny a week out of your pocket money you took him up 30 steps on a cardboard chart to heaven – 
where the child Jesus stood at the top to welcome him. Vast sums of money were collected in this way. In 1968, the black babies of Catholic childhood started appearing on television. They were Biafran and they were starving. For most Catholics, it was as simple as that. The politicians, the businessmen, the professional Africa watchers had more complex reasons for backing Biafra. But for most Catholics, the appeal was direct and irresistibly emotional. So she, what she's not saying there, and I'm not implying that all Irish people thought of the Igbo people as children, but it does seem likely that the humanitarian impulse had an unconscious base in the lessons of childhood that most Irish people had experienced in school. There was a sense in which it was felt that the Irish state had a responsibility to do something. And maybe it was the experience in the Congo that provided the Irish with a confidence regarding their effectiveness and agency in intervening in international conflict. Certainly everyone had an opinion regarding the Nigeria Biafra situation, and many suggested that Ireland should take an active role in negotiating a settlement between the warring parties as a country which could not be regarded as harbouring dreams of empire building. We are the very country to do it, and we have done nothing, Anthony Esmond, Esmond declared in the Dáil in February 1969, and this was a commonly held view. Public representatives, journalists, and members of religious orders called on the Irish government to take a stand, but the re government remained steadfast in its support of the Nigerian state, despite serious qualms about the civilian bombings and other atrocities, as well as the deliberate policy of starvation about which the relevant ministers were aware. The extent to which the opinion of the Irish public was at odds with the stance of the Irish government on the issue complicates the whole episode from an Irish perspective, and from my perspective makes it all a lot more interesting. Although the Department of External Affairs was in close contact with the ambassador in Lagos and reasonably well informed regarding events as they unfolded, it was decided that, that it would be a mistake to give publicity to the facts in this matter on the grounds that embarrassing the federal government could do damage to the status and future of Irish missionaries in the region. It clearly wasn't only the safety of individual missionaries that concerned the government and the missionary organisations, but the future of the missionary project itself was to take precedence over any moral concerns about how the war was being waged. Of course, the Department of External Affairs was not the only conduit for the dissemination of these stories. The Irish public soon became aware of all the atrocities and could only wonder at the department's seeming lack of information and or interest. And there was a sense that continued inactivity was dishonouring Ireland before the eyes of the world. Journalist John Horgan referred to the moral paralysis that seemed to have taken hold. The helplessness of the international community to intervene became evident. Even when presented with evidence of civilian bombings and a famine which the federal government justified, claiming that hunger was a legitimate weapon of war, International associations of influential nations, such as the Commonwealth and the United Nations, proved unable to influence events. The deadlock between the federal government and the Biafran government regarding the delivery of aid exposed the flaws in and the ineffectiveness of existing aid structures in these circumstances. Ojukwu himself suggested in March 1968 to an Irish journalist that the major powers, for their own economic considerations, were unwilling to do anything, and that perhaps the small country really does have a role to play in this. They've got no axe to grind. There are no pies for them to dip their fingers in. While children walked, skipped, and organised jumble sales to raise funds for the starving Biafrans, the Department of External Affairs was reluctant to even use the word Biafra. And in official documents, the word Biafra is always rendered in quotation marks, suggesting an unreality, a so-called state. The newspapers had no such qualms or diplomatic niceties with which they were required to be concerned. And from its very inception, the new state and its citizens were named without ambiguity Biafra and Biafrans. A photograph in the Irish Independent just before the war's end pictures three new graduates of the Royal College of Surgeons, the caption describing one as being from Nigeria, the second from Glenagiri, and the third from Biafra. Indeed, in various contexts in which they were identified in newspapers, missionary priests were also noted as being from Biafra specifically, rather than Nigeria, including, for example, in death notices of relatives in which they or their families presumably chose the wording of the text. In fact, amusingly, not only did Biafra exist, in some newspaper accounts it seemed that Biafra had always existed. I found a story in which a priest home on a visit at the end of 1969 was described as having already spent 11 years in Biafra, 
Another priest is described elsewhere as being over 20 years in Biafra, and yet another spent 30 years in Biafra. So, so you can see how easily the concept of Biafra was accepted by the Irish people. Indeed, indeed this, easy, these easy, this easy acceptance of the new state was one of the factors which led to representatives of the Nigerian embassy in Dublin making numerous complaints to the Irish government regarding what they saw as the anti-Nigerian bias in the Irish newspapers. As early as the end of 1967, a crisis in the food supply had developed and appeals for aid were being made by church groups. It wasn't until May or June in 1968 that the British media began to report on famine conditions in Biafra, but as early as December 1967, the Irish Independent carried a report that in Dublin a group was being formed to raise funds for medical and missionary supplies to be sent to Biafra. And that's something about which we'll hear a lot more tomorrow morning, as we have two founders of Africa Concern, now Concern International, here with us. In spring 1968, descriptions of malnutrition were appearing in the national media, and throughout 1968 and 69, reports of fundraising initiatives to help the starving people of Biafra were a feature of news reportage, both locally and nationally. Once the famine developed, fundraising became a nationwide endeavour, and campaigns drew on inter-county rivalries in an effort to increase the amounts raised. Efforts ranged from the straightforward door-to-door -door collection to the more energetic rolling a barrel for 40 miles, from the symbolic 24-hour fast to the more ironic, in the context, cake sale. Adults and children from all parts of the country were urged to remember our own famine. It wasn't only money that was sought. Powdered milk, cloth and wool, drugs and other medical supplies were requested also. The Irish people were reminded how well off they were. The occasional dissenting voice asked why so much money was being sent to West Africa when issues of poverty and rural underdevelopment were not being addressed at home. But on the whole, there was nothing but full support for efforts to alleviate suffering in, specifically in most cases, Biafra. So why do the people of Ireland embrace this cause? West Africa is a long way from Ireland. But it's clear that despite the geographical distance, there was a huge connection with the starving people of Biafra. The phenomenon was such that it could not simply be explained as an emotional reaction to the terrible images and descriptions to which people were exposed. Leaving aside the historical mem memory of famine for the moment, the idea of a small state fighting for independence struck a chord with the Irish people. Ignoring the issue that Biafra might be seen as similar to Northern Ireland, an integral part of a state deciding to be separate, the Irish supported the romantic ideal of independence. That is not to say that no one pointed out the alternative reading of events, but the overwhelming interpretation was to compare the Republic of Biafra to the Republic of Ireland gaining independence for an, from an oppressive coloniser. And of course, neatly ignoring the historical event of Nigerian independence in 1960. Colonel Joku himself was quick to suggest a parallel with Irish experience at every opportunity. In an address on the 1st of July in 1968, he made reference to the Anglo-Irish War, saying, their behaviour today against Biafra coincides with their behaviour in 1921-22 against another people struggling as we are doing today for self-determination and security. The pattern is the same. It was reported in The Guardian that referring to the civil war in Ireland in 1921, he said that England's hypocrisy, duplicity and blackmail regarding the Nigerian-Biafran conflict was merely a repetition of that earlier post-colonial war. The editor of the Irish Times, responding to a letter about this matter, noted that recognition of Biafra at an early stage would have given a lead. We should have been the first to, rec to extend recognition to a country undergoing torments such as Ireland has never suffered in modern history. When John Horgan interviewed him in March 1968, Colonel Ajoku stated his belief that Ireland should bring direct diplomatic pressure to bear on Nigeria to bring about a cessation of hostilities and a committal to negotiation as the only way of really sol solving the problem. He suggested there was a lot the Irish could do, saying, I think too that when there is very little a country can do, she can probably get a hearing in the world on a moral basis. I think she could cry out against the crime being committed against humanity in this area. I do not think any country should sit by and watch this kind of genocide. Ireland, of course, has a peculiar experience, which is somewhat akin to ours, and we have had historical associations with Ireland. Oh, yes, they are the people who really developed, civilised, or whatever it is. They have had a lot of contacts here, and I think they are in a better position, perhaps, than most to understand our problem. <laughs>
This is their own experience and their own association with us. Later that same year, in an interview with another Irish journalist, Des Mullen, a joke we remarked concerning the Irish. With them, we have a special attachment. Anybody who speaks English in Biafra certainly has a little bit of Irish spirit in them, he joked. We always feel the Irish would understand our problem because it is a repetition of Irish history. And many Irish people agreed. To many people, the Biafran fight for freedom was a romantic ideal with echoes of Irish history. Interestingly, by the summer of 1968, when Ajoku was making these connections with Irish political history, there was a serious shortage of food in Biafra, but a shared experience of famine was never alluded to. To have admitted the scale of the disaster at this stage would have undermined the credibility of the state of Biafra as a successful project. And so positive announcements about the establishment of a land army to plant crops and other remedial policies were being made as conditions further deteriorated. Journalists reported admiringly on the rather idyllic society which was being established in Biafra as Ajoku entertained them on his lawn. So rather than it being the Biafran propaganda machine that spread the story of the famine, certainly initially it was the missionaries working with the victims who drew journalists' attention to the catastrophe and who were responsible for attracting the attention of the outside world to what was happening. It seems hardly likely that Ajoku was unaware of the Irish famine, um, given his knowledge of other aspects of Irish history. So the only reason I can think that it wasn't being used was because, um, as I say, these kind of trappings of democracy and nationhood, um, you know, that there was a, an attempt to argue that Biafra was succeeding as a civil society, and obviously the famine was undermining any such claims. In Ireland, the folk memory of On Gertha Moore, the Great Famine, is still strong, and the famine is commemorated today in museums, public monuments, and in annual events such as the Famine Walk. A donation by the Choctaw Nation to Irish famine victims in 1847 is still remembered and acknowledged. In the late 1960s, the comparisons between the Irish famine and the Biafran famine were unavoidable. Appeals were worded in emotive language and individuals were urged to remember our own famine. The attacks on the Igbo population in 1966 had been described as genocide and the famine now led to allegations of a policy of extermination. Nigeria's case wasn't helped by claims that starvation was a legitimate and historic strategy in warfare. It was reported in June 1969 that Chief Awolowo had said, all is fair in war and starvation is one of the weapons of war. I don't see why we should feed our enemies fat only to fight us harder. Nigerian objections to the flights which carried food into Biafra were based on the suspicion that supplies other than food were being carried on these planes and accusations of gun running were made on more than one occasion accusations which have always been denied. In a press release from the Federal Ministry of Information in Lagos in December 1968, it was stated, food is the means to resistance. It is ammunition in this sense, and the mercy flights into rebel territory, whether they take arms or not, are looked upon as tantamount to gun running. However, readers in Ireland were reminded that the difference between a small hungry boy in Ireland and one in Biafra is merely time and place. Typical of the stories in the newspapers is one written by Irish independent journalist Des Mullen in which he described a collection of grass huts crowded with hundreds of refugee families, most of whom showed signs of starvation. Here there were strings of grasshoppers, bats and insects for sale, famine-stricken people, old men, shriveled up women and little children, recognisable only as such by their size. The flesh had long since disappeared from their bones, and these were not the worst cases. He describes it as a nightmarish sight. He continues, I wondered was this what the famine in Ireland was like 120 years ago when a journalist in the town of Skibbereen found a mother and five children dying of hunger in a cabin. That such a similar horror should happen in this enlightened age seemed impossible. In response to such accounts, the entire Irish population seems to have become involved in trying to alleviate hunger and famine in Biafra. Fundraising became bound up in some of the most traditional aspects of Irish culture. The proceeds of a fesh in Durham Boylan were donated to Biafra. The chairman of Coalthus Kiltorieran said that as the descendants of a people who had experienced similar suffering at the hands of a more powerful neighbour, it was only right that there should be a more ready response from us to the daily heart-rending appeals from Biafra. <laughs> 
again in the Kerry Man in 1968, in a column titled By Afra and Ireland, it is natural that we as a people should feel for the victims of starvation wherever they may be. Our folk memory of our own famine is still strong enough within us to make ready identification easy. And the other aspect of this famine which resonated was then mentioned. How much worse is famine when it is induced by the act of man? While few would argue that the war, however we name it, was a religious one, some early Biafran propaganda did flag the conflict as a religious war between Muslims and Christians. Many Irish Catholics in the late 1960s would have been growing more critical and questioning of practices within the Catholic Church, but they would still defend the faith, and the Pope's message of support for the poor suffering people of Biafra would have encouraged them in their stance. A series of pamphlets published by the government printer Enugu on the Nigeria-Biafran conflict included the first one titled The Role of Religion, which claimed that religion is a basic factor in this conflict. It stated that southern Nigeria, of which Biafra was a part, is predominantly Christian and mentions the advantages of, of education brought by Christian missionaries. The pamphlet links the idea of religious jihad to genocide and quotes from a Time magazine article which provided first-hand accounts of the massacres in the north in 1966, describing raging mobs of Muslims armed with iron bars and broken bottles. Um, in the pamphlet, the sentence goes on, surging through the streets, killing Biafran civilians. In fact, the original article was surging through the streets, shouting anti-Ebo slogans. So you can see how the kind of propaganda machine took hold of an existing article and sort of just changed it subtly. Also, um, Hausa troops were reportedly screaming the blood curses of a Muslim holy war, bayoneting Igbo workers in the bar, gunning them down in the corridors and hauling Igbo passengers off the plane to be lined up and shot. The, this article in time is frequently used over and over again in different co contexts um, by the Biafran propaganda machine, but it was certainly, those articles were very powerful and very vivid and described cer certainly a terrible massacre that had happened. The pamphlet also claimed that the conduct of the war on Nigeria's side has shown quite conclusively that genocide is being perpetrated and condoned in the interest of Islam and of Muslim power, and noted that Arab Muslim countries of Africa and Middle, the Middle East had come to the aid of their northern Nigeria, Nigerian fellow Muslims through the war. There was also an accusation of desecration of holy places in Biafra, buildings destroyed and holy objects looted. Indeed, some Irish missionaries reported these events too, but remarked wearily that it was often the Igbos themselves in desperation who were carrying out this looting. One noted that green vestments were particularly sought after as they provided camouflage in the bush, which provides a lovely image of, sort of priestly types kind of scurrying around with weaponry. Um, it should be pointed out that General Gowan repeatedly rejected suggestions that the war was a religious one, and very few missionaries would have actually subscribed to that charge. The Biafran government also expressed surprise that Christian Britain, which has been closely associated with Nigeria and Biafra for over a century, and did actually govern those areas for over 60 years, should be actively collaborating with Muslim northern Nigeria and atheist Russia in conducting a veritable jihad against Christian Biafra. Indeed, British backing for the federal government was probably more of a factor in popular Irish support for the state of Biafra than any defense of the faith. From the beginning, the British were supporting the federal government with arms, bullets and bombs. As reports of the atrocities caused by the bombing of civilian targets became known, the British public questioned the policy. Debates in the House of Parliament gradually exposed the extent of support that Nigeria was getting from Britain and drew attention to the misinformation to which the British public was being subjected. The BBC's coverage was constantly exposed as inaccurate and the Irish Embassy in Lagos believed the advice of the British High Commissioner in Lagos to his government to have been consistently misinformed. Um, Hunt, David Hunt, consistently reporting that the war would be over in a matter of weeks, which presumably affected British policies and indeed may have affected the Irish government's um, stance as well. Ambassador Kevin Rush, in a confidential memo, which, of course, after 30 years you can get access to in the National Archives, um, recalled that, as a that a councillor in the British High Commissioner was offering bets at a cocktail party on the 6th of August 1967 that the war would be over by the end of the month and that oil would be flowing again by October 1967. 
uh, obviously <laughs> not, not quite right. Um, the Irish public had probably never trusted the British media, and so at an earlier stage when offered two versions of events, the British government account in contradiction of the Irish missionary stories, the Irish public was always going to believe the missionaries. However, at a diplomatic level, there was some friction between the Irish and the British reading of events, and not everyone was inclined to believe the missionaries' reports of atrocities. At a meeting with the British High Commissioner and Mr Olson of the American Embassy in Lagos to discuss the concern in Ireland regarding the bombing of hospitals, the Irish ambassador was told that both men felt the missionary accounts to be exaggerated and unreliable. At a news conference in London, a spokesman for the Biafran Coordinating Committee declared that the Irish were closest in spirit to the Igbo. In Ireland, there was a reference to shared values, a similar type of society. For example, there was an extended family system which helped to absorb the refugees as they streamed back to Biafra from the north. It was also noted that the Igbos embraced a way of life based on community effort. Perhaps these references suggest a nostalgia for a changing Ireland, a modernising Ireland, in which these ideas of extended family and um, community effort were beginning to be eroded. And the sense of brotherhood may have been overstated. Um, it's hard to believe that the, the question of race didn't arise at all in these discussions of brotherhood. Um, but it seems to have been something that was pretty much... Um, ignored. Some newspaper articles did have what might be considered racist overtones. Um, one, one article mentions the colour problem and the prospect of coloured emigration. There are also references to the Commonwealth Conference where the, Af the leaders of African nations are referred to disparagingly as a group of detribalised feared dua, most of them corrupt one-party dictators. So there were some still quite unreconstructed views of Africa, to put it kindly, um, with words like primeval used to describe the society. But often these were used in a context of traditionalism and pastoral innocence. Um, in contrast to some reports, for example, in the Times, where references to primitivism are invoking savagery and, more, um, and images that come from sort of more typical imperial discourse. Um, Frederick Forsyth was one of the journalists whose reports were widely read and which helped to kind of aff affect British public opinion. Um, but some of, some of his writing is really quite um, kind of racist in tone. He says things like, there are forces let loose in Biafra that white men cannot understand. Um, he, I don't read all these, there's too much detail here, but um, he talks about um, gutted hamlets, rotting corpses, extreme kind of detail about the conditions that were there. And, yeah, sorry, I skipped through that a little bit. I think that's. Um, he talks about the the the, um, the Nigerian government were were keen not to engage with the media at all, and in effect, by refusing to cooperate, actually caused friction with the journalists, the very people who they were counting on to tell their side of the story, which was a bit of an unwise tactic. Um, the Biafrans, on the other hand provided abundant information, which did mix fact and propaganda, some exaggeration, some lies, but they prov provided this story which, and the, the images, which was what the media wanted and enabled people to tell their story, whereas the federal government were um, actually putting obstacles in the way of their story being told. And how the war was being represented became at least as important as how it was being fought. The use of propaganda and the public relation firms hired to represent each side at an international level introduced a whole new dimension to the conflict. While the Biafrans were masterful in their propaganda efforts, entertaining journalists, providing media-friendly reports, the federal government um, were initially less cooperative with the media and scathing of the propaganda being produced by the Biafrans. The British, too, dismissed the Biafran accounts as propaganda and tended to accept the federal government's version of events, a course of action which proved unwise. It's evident that a country such as Nigeria, with representation at international level and embassies around the world, had a network of communications in place to represent its interests already. Biafra, on the other hand, used public relations companies to provide that communications role internationally. 
Ironically, considering that the missionaries became the conduit for so many of the news stories that emerged from Biafra, a story shortly after the outbreak of war describes the Irish missionaries as isolated in Biafra. They have no mail or newspapers from outside, no means of communicating with either their families or their headquarters abroad, and no telephone or telegraph connection with any place outside the boundaries of the beleaguered territory. In fact, due to their familiarity with the place, they were sought after by journalists and often interviewed. They, of, they also sent letters home and addressed audiences in community centres and churches when home on visits. Their contribution to the media coverage was immense. In July 1969, in the Sunday Independent, journalist Kieran Carty, who we're pleased to have here, res was responding to accusations that reports in Irish newspapers had been one-sided. He argued that when missionaries had brought back reports of famine and atrocity 16 months previously, there had been virtually no coverage, so that the missionaries were the only source for these accounts. He also mentioned the fact that RTE newsmen from the seven-day documentary team had been banned by the government from going to Biafra because it was feared that this would be something the Nigerian government would protest about. And um, documents sourced, a documentary which was sourced el elsewhere, which was shown on RTE, had led to a protest from the Nigerian embassy. He added that the letter writer seemed to imply that the Biafran cause is in some way discredited by the employment of a Swiss public relations firm to assist in its presentation. Public relations is not a dishonourable profession. Most companies and, and organisations and governments use PR men to provide information about their work. And this is the point Mark Press had been employed. There was actually a series of public relations agencies that were used throughout the war. But um, public relations was talked about. PR companies were sort of dismissed as something that were, was, was inventing stories that was um, discredited. And in fact, the Biafrans had really no other way of, of, of representing themselves internationally. Carty also pointed out that it shouldn't be assumed that Irish newspapers had relied on public relations handouts for information about the war. The evidence of 430 missionaries who worked in the war area is surely above question, he said. And the missionaries' um, influence, as we all know, was enormous in this regard. And again, this is something we'll be talking about later. In discussing the war, the terminology we use is still a problem today. While the Nigerians insisted that the war was an internal matter, a civil war, most, if not all, Biafrans would reject that classification of their struggle for independence. The Nigeria Biafra War seems a reasonable working title for the events of 1967 to 70, but to most Irish people, the word Biafra is sufficient to summon up memories of the war and famine and the events and media coverage in Ireland at the time. The Nigerian Civil War would not produce that recognition, hence the name of this conference. Even today, the name Biafra and its usage are loaded with significance. Some would argue that Biafra never existed, others that it still exists. For many, it had a transient existence as an independent state in West Africa, evidenced by its flag, currency and stamps, material remnants of a short-lived ideal. Even today in Ireland, among a generation for whom the geographical and historical reference means nothing, the word Biafra has resonance. A person of extreme thinness is often referred to as like a Biafran. Biafra also has connotations of disaster and destruction, often far removed from the realities. In 1986, a catastrophic scene of flooding in North Tipperary prompted a local councillor to remark that he thought he was witnessing scenes from Biafra. Contemporaneously with the Nigeria Biafra War, County Leitrim was described as the Biafra of Ireland. And, I mean, I presume Leitrim wasn't planning on declaring itself an independent state. I think we can refer to the, who knows, yes, uh, this reference was to its relatively impoverished state at the time. Another reference I found, which uh, at the end of 1969, just before the war came to a conclusion, um, there was a protest in Galway regarding a system of payment to road workers, which was seen as inadequate and the timing of it was bad and people were running out of money for food. And um, the story about this hardship that was being caused was, was, was flagged as Biafra conditions in Galway. So you can see how the word Biafra is being used in multiple and strange contexts. Um, but sadly for the idealists who envisaged a new African state, the word Biafra seems to often be linked in Irish minds with images of poverty and hardship, starvation, destruction. And how is it remembered and recorded in formal texts? In a History Ireland article published in 2000, um, part of the title of which is The Forgotten War, which 
gives a hint immediately. Um, Enda Staunton remarks on the fact that by the end of the 1970s, a school textbook defined the conflict as between, between Igbos and Yorubas. And in other histories of Ireland in the 20th century, it receives a scarce mention. Certainly immediately after the war, there seems to have been a conscious pro process of forgetting, perhaps with the intention of healing wounds. After the war, diplomatic relations with Nigeria were cordial. The Irish state had never wavered in its support of the federal government, despite criticising some of its wartime policies. And while the Irish public had been in support of Biafra, this could be interpreted as a purely humanitarian effort rather than a political action. From the point of view of Irish missionary work, there was no value in dwelling on the events of the war, at an official level at least. However, such events cannot be written out of history. Over these two days, we'll be hearing about the experiences of many individuals. And in addition to these personal memories, there is a popular and social memory of the effects of the war on the Ireland of the late 1960s. An event which had so much resonance in Ireland cannot simply be forgotten. The experience of so many men and women cannot be erased. Neither can the real consequences in terms of the development of Irish international aid policies and the establishment of NGOs such as Concern International. So I would suggest that while Biafra has not been forgotten, its legacy in Ireland has not been fully appreciated. To some extent, it has been misremembered. Despite the fact that the Irish government never recognised the state of Biafra and continued diplomatic relations with Nigeria throughout the war, a mention of Biafra often evokes the memory that Ireland supported Biafra during the war. The causes of the war and the events that motivated the de Declaration of Independence are less well understood or remembered than is the subsequent famine and the terrible images of starvation which came to represent the name Biafra. But at the time it penetrated every aspect of Irish society, cultural events, entertainment, children's games, GAA, pantomimes, fancy dress, don't ask about that one, um, dancing, fashiona. And a report in the Southern Star which said, the Crusaders march again is an interesting example of one effect that the war might have had in, in Ireland. Um, signs of enthusiasm allied to youthful endeavour were, were described. It's becoming increasingly plain that the bubbling energy of youth when directed towards the right targets makes a wonderful contribution to the society of the late 60s. So it was a cause that brought the generations together and at a time when youth were rebelling and probably growing apart from the older generations, the Biafran cause provided pause for thought and suggested that young people weren't altogether bad and might work with the other generations um, in, for, for, for a good cause. So perhaps alongside the negative images of destruction and hunger, the word Biafra can also evoke a sense of idealism and courage of a time when the recognition of similarities between peoples was more important than the racial differences. Ireland looked outwards with a new confidence and saw that even a small country could have influence and committed itself to the humanitarian ideal and participation in the greater world. The story of Biafra became an element of the story of Ireland and had a crucial impact on how the modern Ireland would develop. Strange as it may seem to imagine Biafra as an aspect of Irish history, I believe that the Irish involvement with Biafra had a lasting impact in Irish society. And I suggest that the public interest generated by the war can tell us a lot about the Ireland of the late 1960s, a small, independent, rapidly modernising state on the edge of Europe, and how it saw its role in the wider world. This conference is an attempt to remember, to acknowledge that legacy, and recognise how the relationship with the Republic of Biafra helped to define the Republic of Ireland. Thank you. Thank you.